All right, welcome back. In this video, we're gonna talk about section 13.2 from Stewart's Calculus, Early Transcendentals, 8th edition. Section 13.2 involves the derivatives and integrals of vector functions. So we define the idea of a vector function um, in 13.1, so now we'll think, well, how do we take the derivative of that? So start out with derivatives. So if we have the derivative r prime of a vector function r, okay, we define it the same way as for real value functions. So dr dt is just which we also call r prime of t. It's the limit as h goes to zero of r of t plus h minus r of t over h. This is identical to how we define the derivative of real value functions. The only difference is this is a vector function. This is a bold r, right? It's a vector function. But otherwise, if I just replace this bold faced r with a regular f, it would be the definition of f prime as well. Now we call r prime of t the tangent vector to the curve that's traced out by r of t. So if we have a curve c that's given by r, then r prime of t is gonna be the, the tangent vector to the curve at a point p. So for some t, you get a point p along the curve. r prime of t is gonna be the tangent vector to the curve there, um, provided that r prime of t exists and isn't zero, okay? So the tangent line, if we have a tangent, we actually have a curve in say three dimensional space or whatever space. We actually have a tangent line to c at a point p and it's just defined to be the line through that point p which is parallel to the tangent vector, r prime. And finally, we'll sometimes be interested in the unit tangent vector, which you just take r prime of t and you divide it by its, its length. Uh, there should be a prime here, my mistake. Okay. Now, here's basically just a picture that sort of explains where why is r prime of t the tangent vector. You have a point p here, which is given by, it's the, it's the point given by the position vector r of t. You have a point q over here, which is given by the position vector r of t plus h. So as h goes to zero, right, this point q is gonna slide along the curve towards p, and you can see this vector is gonna point sort of in a direction of a tangent vector. And so, you know, if you divide r of t plus h minus r of t, so again, you get this difference by, if you take the difference of these two vectors, it's gonna be the, the vector that points from p to q. If you scale it by one over h, it's gonna change the length, but basically, as h goes to zero, we slide q along the curve, and eventually when it gets to p, you end up with the tangent vector there, okay? All right, theorem, if you have a function r of t that has components f, g, and h, and these f, g, and h are all differentiable functions, then the derivative of r exists, and the derivative of r is just f prime, has components f prime, g prime, and h prime. The proof of this is not given in this video, but if you want to, go ahead and look at section 13.2. It's actually really straightforward because if I go back and look at the definition of the derivative, right, it's just a limit. And so you can just, you know, add the components. When you take this difference of vectors, you just take the difference in the components. You're scaling it by one over h, so you scale the components by one over h. And then the limit, when you take the limit of a vector function, you're just taking the limits of each component. So really, it shouldn't be surprising at all that this is what you get. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, open up to 13.2 and find the proof of this theorem. It should be self-explanatory. All right, here's an example. Find the derivative of the vector function r of t, which is 2t squared plus one times i plus t sine pi of t times j plus natural log of t times k, and then find the unit tangent vector when t is one. Take a moment and try it yourself. All right, had a moment? You know, you should pause it when I do that, right? <laughs> All right, so r prime of t, I just take the derivative of each component. So the derivative of 2t squared plus one is just 4t, so I get 4t times i, for t times sine of pi t, I have to use the product rule. So it's gonna be the first function, t, times the derivative of sine of pi of t, which is just gonna be pi times cosine of pi t. And then plus the second function, sine of pi of t, times the derivative of the first function, the derivative of t is just one. So I get all of that times j. And then the derivative of natural log of t is just one over t. So I get one over t times k. And if I want the unit tangent vector when t is one, then I just have to calculate t of, or sorry, uh, let me calculate first r of one, r prime of one. r prime of one is just gonna be four i. If you plug in one into this function t equals one, this is gonna be uh, cosine of pi, so you're gonna get cosine of pi here, that's negative one. So you just get negative pi, and then sine of pi will be zero. So you'll just get negative pi times j, and then you plug one in for t in the last component, and you get one over one, so you get one k. 
So we can write this like this. It's four negative pi and one. And so what is the length of that vector? Well, it's just the square root of four squared plus pi squared plus one squared. So that's the square root of 17 plus pi squared. So the unit tangent vector at one would just be the vector four negative pi one divided by the square root of 17 plus pi squared. Just scale our prime of one by its length. And that's it. Okay, find parametric equations for the tangent line to the helix with parametric equations x equals two sine of t, y equals t, and z equals cosine t. So we need a vector function. So you could, you could have these parametric equations for that curve or you could write it as a vector function. It would look like this. So to get the uh, tangent line, if I want the parametric equations tangent line, I need the vector because the tangent line should be parallel to the tangent vector. So I should I need r prime of t. r prime of t, just take the vector, the derivative of each component, you get two cosine of t, one, and negative sine of t. Now, the point two pi over two zero occurs when t is pi over two. You can just look at the y component and it should be sort of clear that the y component of this curve is only gonna be pi over two when t is pi over two. Um, but it works for the other two as well, right? Okay, so we need to figure out what is r prime of pi over two. It's just going to be, uh, so two cosine of pi over two, that's zero. The y coordinate, y component is always one and then negative sine of pi over two, which is negative one. So the parametric equations, right, you just take, for x, you just take the, the x component of that point, or the x, the x coordinate of that point, and add zero times t to get sort of that, that uh, x coordinate. So it's gonna be the uh, x equation for the parametric equation of the tangent line. It's gonna be, z, it's gonna be sorry, two plus zero t. The y is gonna be pi over two plus one t. And the z coordinate is going to be zero plus negative one times t. So it's gonna be negative t. And that's it. So because the tangent line is just a line going through this point that's parallel to this vector. So that's it. All right, we have the following theorem. Now, a lot of our intuition and rules that we have about um, derivatives of real value functions sort of apply to vector value functions. Now we can't multiply two vector valued functions together exactly. We have a dot product and a cross product, um, but it turns out that the product rule basically worked. Now dividing them doesn't really make any sense. So there's no quotient rule equivalent here. But um, okay, so if we have two vector value functions u and v, then if I take the derivative of the sum, it's the same as differentiating each term. So I can differentiate term by term, even if the terms are vector functions. Um, if I have a scalar multiple times a vector function, and I take the derivative, then that's just c times u prime. Um, here, if you have a scalar function, so f is a scalar function and u is a vector value function, and if I multiply u by that scalar function, then I take the derivative of that product, uh, the product rule still holds. It's f prime times u plus f times u prime. If you take a dot product of u and v, they're both vector value functions, then the, there's a product rule, the same as it normally would be u prime times v dot, sorry, u prime dot v plus u dot v prime. And it works for the cross product as well. If you take the derivative of u cross v, it's u prime cross v plus u cross v prime. But it's very important to remember that the cross product, the order matters. So if it's u cross v here, the u has to come first in both of these terms, right? It's u prime first and then u first for the one. And lastly, there's a chain rule. If you compose a vector value function u with a scalar function f of t, then it's just going to be u prime evaluated f of t times f prime. So it's the outside, the derivative of the outside times the derivative of the inside. So the chain rule is basically the same. I don't know why they wrote the f prime in front. I guess because you write scalars in front. Anyway, all right. Uh, here's an interesting one. Show that if the length of a vector valued function is constant, so no matter what t is, 
the vector, the length of the vector on the length of the curve um, of the vector is constant, then show that r prime of t is orthogonal to r of t for all t. Take a moment, think about what this means and see if you can do this yourself. This is a tougher problem. It's in the book, uh, but don't look at it. That's cheating. But um, give it a try. All right, you had your moment? All right, so a fun fact here. Why intuitively should this be true? If, R, if the length of R of t is constant, so no matter what, the length of the vector for any sort of vector pointing to a point along this curve, it's constant. What that means is all of the vectors pointing along that curve have to be pointing to the a shell of a sphere. Basically, if this is true for a vector value function, then the curve it traces out actually lies along the surface of the sphere. So its tangent line will be tangent to that sphere. And so it should be clear on some level that the ve tangent vector should actually be orthogonal to the actual original curve. Um, however, we can actually just show it directly. So um, if you take r dot r of t dot r of t, this has to be equal to c squared, right? Because the length of r of t, the length of r of t would be that, right? Now I'm gonna get rid of the, the roots, but the length of r of t is just the square root of r dot itself. So if you take the derivative of both sides, Well, you get zero on the right-hand side because it's a constant. On the left-hand side, you use the product rule. You get r prime of t dot r of t. And both terms are the same. Just use that product rule that we had in the previous one, um, property number four here. And so you get r of t dot r prime of t equals zero. And since the order of the dot product doesn't matter, this is just two r prime of t dot r of t equals zero. You can divide both sides by two and we get r of t or r prime of t if you want, it doesn't matter which one, doesn't matter which one comes first. You get that r prime dot r is zero and that means that r and r prime are orthogonal no matter what t is because their dot product is zero and that's the definition of orthogonal according to me, not necessarily the book. Okay, we can do integrals as well. So the definite integral of a continuous vector function, r of t is defined in a way, again, similar to real value functions. So if I take the integral from a to b of the vector function, r of t dt, that's just the limit of Riemann sums, but this isn't exactly rectangles anymore. This is, this is not the area of a rectangle anymore, but still, it should look exactly the same. If you had a non-bolded f, this would be exactly the same as you would have seen in, in your integral calculus course, math 2b, if you were at UCI. Now, this thing right here is simply just what is this vector? Take the sum i goes from 1 to n of this. It's just going to have this vector with these three components. And so you can take the limit of this. It's just the limit of this vector sort of uh, here. And so since you can take the limit of this vector by just taking the limit of each component, you get that the integral from a to b of r of t dt is just, you just integrate term by, you just integrate component by component. So you can just integrate each component. So notice that the definite integral from a to b of r of t dt, it's gonna be a, a vector. It's gonna be a constant vector. Each one of these integrals is a number, but you get just some sort of constant vector, okay? So, and then of course we can extend the, the fundamental theorem of calculus to vector functions. So in other words, if you have the integral from a to b of r of t dt, this is just gonna be equal to uppercase vector function r of t evaluated from a to b, where this uppercase vector function r is an antiderivative of r. So in other words, r capital R prime equals r, lowercase r. All right, evaluate this integral. So this is just equal to the integral from one to four of two t to the three halves dt times i plus, so notice there's no j component here. So it would be the integral of zero j, but that's just still zero. And then uh, the integral of from one to four of t plus one 
root t dt times k like that. Okay, so for this one, you just get 2t to the 5 halves divided by 5 halves evaluated from 1 to 4 times i plus this one. Okay, so the trick here is that this one, if you multiply it out, you have t times root t, that's t to the 3 halves. And then root t times 1 would give you t to the 1 half. So if you do that, you're going to get um, t to the 5 halves over 5 halves plus t to the 3 halves over 3 halves evaluated from 1 to 4 times k. Uh, what do we get if we work this out? So if you simplify this, uh, two, 2 over 5 halves is going to be 4 fifths. So we just get 4 fifths times 4 to the 5 halves minus 4 fifths, you know, 1 to the 5 halves, but that's fine, times i. And then plus, uh, again, plug in 4 here, you're going to get 2 fifths 4 to the 5 halves plus 2 thirds, 4 to the 5 halves, and then minus, when you plug in 1, you're just going to get uh, 2 fifths plus 2 thirds times k. I don't really want to simplify this out, but I guess I have to. So 4 to the 5 halves is really just the square root of four to the fifth power. So four to the five halves is actually just 32. So we get oh, 32 times four, we're gonna get 128 over five minus four over five. So that's just gonna be 124 over five. Uh, I plus the K component is gonna be more annoying. So um, right here, this is going to be, again, 32. So you're going to get 32 times 2, 64 over 5. Minus 2 fifths is going to be 62 over 5. And then um, this should be, I made a mistake here. This should be uh, 3 over 2, my mistake. If you take... Uh, Four to the three halves is going to be two cubed. It's going to be eight. So you're going to get 16 over three minus two over three. It's going to be minus 14 over three times K. And, you know, you can work that out yourself. Um, but that's the basic idea. So anyway, that's it. So, you know, for vector value functions are pretty straightforward. Most things come down to just doing them component by component. So for derivatives, integrals, it's just integrate the components, differentiate the components. Maybe do that in the opposite direction I said. Um, in any case, uh, I think it's a relatively simple section, but uh, if you have any questions, um, you know, feel free to drop me a line or ask me in class if you are in my class. All right, that's it. Have a good one, guys.